Can you repeat that question to me? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we 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 are just curious of uh, so uh, we have a lot of Robinhood investors venturing into the stock market these days. All of us have this real craze of uh, trying to make a lot of money by uh, investing at befitting places. So, what was your initial experience like when you were a seventeen-year-old, featuring fresh into the stock market, trying to do whatever you can in the best of your capacities? Well, when you're starting off, you're generally much like any other uh, person who starts investing. do many things wrong i think uh, the basic mistakes anybody entering the stock market makes is stuff like trying to make too much money too quickly uh, if you're trying to enter the stock market trying to double your money or make a 50% return more often than not you end up uh, failing one of the first lessons in the stock market which uh, experience taught me much like it might have taught other people is uh you know not to leverage not to trade on borrowed money uh, having stop losses in place and and to come to the understanding that outside of uh what you have learned about the market in terms of trading philosophy and psychology it's very important to kind of respect the market and have the understanding that nobody can really call what might or will happen tomorrow and kind of fine tune your own personal portfolio to be able to cope with uh any kind of event or spike in volatility that might happen in either direction and i think focusing on that helps a lot so i infer from a lot of articles that you're a big fan of volatility not in personal relations but in markets that's what i infer as a first uh, right sir <laughs> Oh, uh, speaking of volatility, so what was your initial portfolio decision like? Why, how how was it guided? More importantly, what were the what do you call uh, sources? Yeah, so I mean, volatility is it depends on what kind of a strategy you're running in the market. If you're a vanilla blue chip large cap fund or a large cap portfolio manager, I think volatility is detrimental in many ways. But if you run a long short book which i typically do amongst many portfolios that i manage uh, i think their volatility aids performance a lot because uh, when things become really volatile people trade based on sentiment and it kind of skews prices and uh, uh, prices to a point where you can take advantage of it by running a long short model so hence i like uh, volatility in the markets i think any as a long shot fund manager would second that in a way absolutely absolutely so you also speak a uh, highly of psychology and philosophy going on line with whatever a person learns in trading so uh -huh. how, how does how does a what do you call a potential investor strike a balance between proper alignment of reading and uh, all the different fields how does he go on to strike a balance uh how does the professional strike a balance between yeah between between all the key decisions between all the different fields that he wishes to uh, garner knowledge from yeah i think when you attempt every new thing and you spend a certain amount of time learning about a new topic or a new industry uh, you will figure out what you're leaning towards a little more strongly and i think very naturally you can figure out what is right for you or which industry is right for you absolutely absolutely and then uh, speaking of your uh, experiences as, as an investor you went on to uh, spotlight the very problem of brokerage in india which prevents uh, a lot of people from actually uh, enjoying investing so uh, speaking of you so where did that uh, idea where did that actual uh, eureka uh, what do you call scene Take place in your life that yeah, I need to find zero. I need to find zero along with my brother. I don't think it was anything like that. I think uh, uh, we were traders and we were paying a lot of fees and a lot of brokerage. Uh, we were looking for a way to alleviate that, and I think we kind of decided to take a broking license and start uh, trading to save the cost we paid as uh, traders using different brokers. 
that kind of nat- naturally progressed into being a broker because our friends and family first piled on. And then the other traders that we knew were also using our platform and it grew organically from there. So it was not a plan that was followed to the T and, you know, we kind of, uh, we did not really know that it was going to turn out to be what it became many years down the line. It was again, you know, something we got very lucky and stumbled upon. So it's all a matter of chance, Zero, the all a matter of chance to beacon as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure along the way we have done a few things right, but to a large extent, many things are uh, a factor of chance. Many, many things in business, especially in startups, what works and what does not is you know, up for anybody's interpretation. But we definitely did get lucky to have started in 2009 when uh, we had just seen a bear cycle across the world. And not many people were trying to innovate with broking. So the timing of that was definitely uh, to our favor. And uh, along the way, I'm sure many different uh, things and many different, at many different times, we've gotten lucky as well. So speaking of zero, the speaking of the startup Sip co-founded. So what were the various impediments or the adversaries which hindered its or maybe played a what do you call pivotal role? What were the various impediments? Could you say that again, please? What were the what were the various impediments or adversaries you faced while co-founding these a couple of startups? The hurdles, yeah. Well, much like anyone else, I think the first one is a regulatory hurdle. You typically have a minimum amount of capital required when you're starting off, which you have to figure out how to uh, organize. And beyond that, I think as a new product without too much of a marketing budget behind you, uh, how to build trust in a user and how to kind of, how to attract the audience who will eventually use your platform is generally the biggest challenge. But if you have to talk about uh, a challenge that kind of keeps repeating itself, I would say it's the regulatory one. So every now and then something changes and as a player in the FinTech ecosystem, you have to adapt and evolve to kind of factor in that new change that has happened. That is quite challenging. And speaking of challenges, was there any mentor in your timeline as a startup co-founder? Was there any sort of a person who was guiding you through? Uh, no one person I can think of as a mentor, no. I don't think so. I think um, many people have had significant influence at many different points of time. I've obviously, my family and a bunch of people. But uh, if I had to fixate upon one person and tell you if there was one mentor, I would say no. Any idols you draw inspiration from? Any, uh, what do you call, uh, people who uh, really inspired you into building a startup? Uh, I think there are many, uh, many socially relevant entrepreneurs out there, uh, not just in India, but across the world. Each one of them is inspiring in their own way. I think uh, from someone like, uh, you know, Azim Premji locally or even the Zoho guy now, the Sridhar Vembu guy, he's doing some incredible things with uh, what he's doing in the village he has moved to in Tamil Nadu and stuff like that. So there are uh, many, many people to get inspiration from, not necessarily based on how successful they have been or the scale of what they're doing, but by virtue of what they're attempting. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, you uh, told us that uh, uh, there were a lot of people who were accredited with your success. You will accredit a lot of them, including your family and uh, a lot of other people. So what role did your family exactly play since the days you quit your education, since since the days you were prioritizing chess, which was absolutely unconventional? Yeah, I mean, family, I would say, uh, I would like say Nitin, who is my brother, has been my partner in everything I have done and we've always done stuff together for uh, many, many years now, like 16, 17 years of our lives. And to have a support system like him or 
be it to have accommodating uh, parents who allowed for me to pursue whatever path I wanted to, or talking about the colleagues that I have today and uh, uh, what makes our core team and what makes Zeroda work in a wave. Everybody from Kailash to Karthik to Renu to Hanan, a whole bunch of people. I think these are the people who kind of make you uh, A, strive a little more than you have already and B, they're the ones who also, you know, come together and make for an outcome to come true. So there are many, many people to thank along the way and uh, many people who have had significant roles in uh, my journey, much like any other entrepreneur's journey. But uh, to fixate upon one person and give you just one name alone, I think is a bit tough. Absolutely. So it's a bit tough. And uh, speaking of speaking of your uh, investing endeavors, you are currently the CIO of both the companies that you've co-founded. Any mm -hmm. specific choosing that particular position, sir? Only because you I'm not really big on designations and uh, what you call your role. What I do enjoy is uh, investing. I think mm -hmm. it's something that kind of wakes me up and gets me to go into work every day. Uh, being able to weigh one asset class versus another and figuring out what to invest in and uh, watching some things work and some things fail. Uh, hence, maybe that word. But uh, that's just a passion outside of uh, outside of the monetary implications of it. I quite enjoy investing and trading on a very personal level. On a very personal level, investment has become more of a hobby than a profession, right, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So speaking of speaking of hobbies, then uh, you keep investing regularly. You have developed a, a proclivity towards investing in uh, right places. So what would be your advice to all the people who are wishing to venture into the stock market? What will be your key advice to all those youngsters out there? Uh, I think the ability to delay gratification in life is, is something which comes with a lot of experience and a lot of turmoil in a way. Uh, don't enter the stock market trying to make a quick buck. Don't uh, come in with say a hundred bucks and lever it up to making it 300 bucks or 500 bucks and trying to turn a quick profit because that often does not work and don't fall for the, the tipsters and the SMS vendors who keep sending, you know, buy something at 50 bucks and sending it at hundred bucks and stuff. That stuff never works. Buy good quality companies, uh, have a, good sound researching method, have a system by virtue of which you invest and look for reasonable amounts of return. You know, if you're making 15% a year, uh, we all fail to realize the power of compounding and at 15%, you're doubling your money every five years. So come in with realistic expectations and align your risk profile to that expectation. I think that's the biggest uh, piece of advice I can give to somebody entering Stock market. It all comes down to alignment again. <laughs> yeah. Have reasonable expectations, I would say. And I was actually uh, reading of uh, the people who invest in stock market. Back in USA, it's roughly close to 75% uh, of the population who uh, invest mm -hmm. in the stock market. But in India, the numbers are quite low, maybe somewhere near 5% or even uh, less. So as a long-term approach, as a, as a befitting solution, what can you think of? to boost these numbers in the Indian subcontinent? I think it's happening. The middle class is definitely growing in India. Uh, financial inclusion is a very real thing today. Uh, we have a bunch of other factors at play, be it a falling interest rate cycles wherein people are less incentivized to leave their money at a bank because they're not even beating inflation now. Uh, say of plateauing real estate sector, which is only yielding about, you know, one or 2% for residential real estate, it does not make so much sense to invest in say a bank FD or real estate. Uh, it doesn't make as much sense as it might have 10 years ago. So people are organically shifting towards the stock markets. 
and also from the point of view of a pandemic, people really like the fact that it's a liquid investment where you can take out the money at any given point of time, which many other asset classes do not provide. So I think the shift is happening, albeit in, at a very gradual uh, low pace. But, you know, like anything else, everything has an inflection point. I don't think, uh, I think this might also have a hockey stick kind of a curve where once we reach critical mass, suddenly everybody will be investing into the stock market. So do you expect any sort of intervention from the government authorities to boost the same? Yeah, sure. I mean, reducing, uh, reducing indirect taxes and uh, normalizing things like, say, uh, security transaction tax or anything which increases the impact a retail user might have to kind of pay each time he buys and sells equity will go a long way in getting new people on board. A lot that the government can do, a lot that they have done in the right direction, but a lot more is probably uh, required to be done to bring a significant portion of our population into the market. When do you think in the end will be realized of actually tapping all the masters of the Indian subcontinent? When do you think will we be uh, equivalent to the Western contemporaries? Uh, completely different demographics in our country. I mean, if you were to look at the tax paying portion of our population, I would say only about 5% of us pay tax as a country. And in that 5%, the even smaller portion has exposure to the stock markets. Uh, so a lot has to change. I don't think it would be fair to compare us to the West, but it's not an apple to apple comparison. But in time with urbanization, with the growing middle class, at some point, uh, I think there will be a catch up and the last leg of the catch up might be much faster than the first few legs of the catch up. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that, that was pretty much with uh, maybe uh, what you envision of the future of investment in India. And uh, how do you expect technology plays a pivotal role in shaping up the future? How do you expect us to keep up with that? Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's an inherent part of every business today. Uh, you might be from a traditional business like, uh, I don't know, you might run a department store, but technology has kind of seeped into every fabric of our society. The technology is probably only going to get more important going forward. And as somebody who's in college today, how old are you guys? 20, 2021. Yeah, I, I would say immaterial of what, <coughs> what subject you might be specializing in. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if you guys are finance or business student or whatever individual stream you might have picked. But technology definitely is very important and will be required or will be helpful to you guys in your careers as you, pro as you progress. Uh, maybe a lot more prevalent three, four years down the line while you're actually looking for a job than it is even today. Absolutely. Uh, coming back to your personal angle, to your personal perceptions of things, you've made a mockery of the uh, school education system, uh, as I uh, would you call loudly proclaim that Nikhil Kamath is a perfect embodiment of a person who, uh, what do you call, de dejects the conventional education system and rises up the ladder. So mm -hmm. what do you think the focus of kids should be? What do you think folk, uh, the kids should prioritize exactly in their lives right now? The thing is, there are many, many people who have kind of quit formal education and... Uh, uh, a few of us have gotten lucky, sure, but I would not like to diss formal education in any way. Uh, to be very candid, I can tell you this, that one thing you will always regret in life is if you have not been to college or if you have dropped out very early, uh, when you interact with people, uh, you will come to realize that some of the most uh, impactful memories of your life, some of the best friendships of your life, and some of the best time in your life, you would speak about as when you were in college. It might not look like it when you're in college, like right now, but I think later in life, you start to reminisce and kind of think about these times. So having dropped out, you will always feel like you missed out on that. Uh, 
uh, was it worth it for me? Yeah, by virtue of how lucky I got. Is it the right decision for another person to make? Uh, just going by the odds, probably not. So uh, formal education has its own uses. I would say uh, more than many other things, the network you build while you're in college and the friends you make uh, just in themselves, those two things would probably make it worth it. And life has many things, you know, I mean, outside of building a business or making money or being successful, uh, to live a, com a complete holistic life, I think there are many other aspects to it. Really. So I would, in fact, you know, speak in favor of formal education than against it. Also, since you were fancying uh, the, the likes of taking up a vocational education right after uh, you took a break for chess, apparently. So right now, in the light of the recent events, NEP, the new education policy, brings out uh, something of a similar, uh, what do you call, a similar option. So what do you have to say? Uh, does that make things easy? Uh, I think to pick a vocation is very important. Uh, the new education policy aside, there is a big gap between what we are taught in college, our education uh, syllabus and the system, versus what is actually required and what makes you better at any job that you might uh, pick or a business that you might start after college. I think uh, a, a part-time vocation or a job or hands-on experience that you might gain will go a long way in helping you and aiding you once you actually start off working full time. So I would I would say yeah that that is it plays a big part and it's very important. And then after you uh, what do you call uh, done reading a lot of stuff after you got done co-founding a startup. So how does it all feel after seeing all that journey, all that vision manifest into reality? How does it feel that now you're at the apex of the startup system being awarded the best startup by the Economics Times if I'm not wrong 2020? How does it feel after you look back at those days that, oh, I was in a similar situation where I was really doubtful of proceeding? Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, it's it's a lot of luck. You don't, uh, you don't realize something is working while you're completely engrossed in trying to make it work. Uh, I don't think I am at the point yet to be able to sit down and objectively look back without any kind of a bias and, you know, actually reflect upon uh, the path or the journey that uh, led us to wherever we have. Also, it's a very fickle thing, you know, I mean, we might be the largest broker today, or we might be a great fund manager, or we might uh, be doing a bunch of things right today. But we're always, you know, just two or three mistakes away from, you know, kind of going to scratch. Uh, most businesses are. So along the way, if there has been one lesson which has stood out is always find people who are better, smarter, and uh, more evolved than you. You will end up meeting people like that while you're uh, running, starting a business. And it's very important to give them positions of uh, power in your company or positions where they are the final decision makers to come to the to arrive at the point where you know that you know you're not the best person for every little job and someone else to do better i think uh, that's a great lesson from any entrepreneur's part so taking uh, what do you call it, uh, reaching out to people for their help instead of micromanaging stuff that's what you uh, lay emphasis on yeah more also that uh, when you find somebody who has aligned with you along the way and is working with you, you kind of understand that that person might be better at your doing your job than you are yourself and allowing for him to do that. I think is very important. That's very important. Right. And then uh, speaking of your hobbies, speaking of your very passion of investing day in and day out, something that you really enjoy. Are you never tired of it? Uh, am I ever tired? Yeah, are you ever tired of it? Tired of it? Tired of it? Uh, tired of what though? Like the whole uh, the rat race in a way? The whole the, the numbers, game of numbers every single day. Waking Not up to really. numbers, sleeping to numbers. 
not really not really uh, i think it's a uh, it's a privilege to have a job where in every day is different so in the market you never know what will happen tomorrow and every day when you go into work uh, something absolutely arbitrary might happen i think that is uh, kind of like you know that keeps you going more than anything unlike other jobs which can get very repetitive this one i think is a lot more uh, interesting i'm not at that so point it's not, so it's not a part of the drudgery that day in and day out you are having to take similar kind of decisions it's not a part of the drudgery yet not at all it's actually a good thing i would say one experience day in and day out new things and new adventures yeah no, no i i quite like uh, the whole stock market ecosystem and how unpredictable it is so i enjoy the ups and downs and the unknowing in the stock markets and kind of like look forward to it how do you, how do you make yourself adaptable enough to all the kind of questions that the stock market throws at you how do you make yourself adaptable well you have to come to the realization that the markets uh, know more than you and uh, you might have been right 99 out of 100 times but the 100th time you might lose all that uh you gained over the previous 99 times i think uh, that humility kind of comes with uh uh with time and experience in the stock market but uh but it's a fun thing yeah i don't know how many of you guys will end up looking at making a career in the stock markets but one thing i can promise you is it'll definitely be exciting and uh Uh, it's a good industry which has plenty of room to grow based on how underpenetrated like you were talking about earlier uh, based on how underpenetrated it is right now i think there will be plenty of opportunities to grow in the future yeah so what do you envision as the end goal for zerola and true beacon what do you envision as the end product for them there there is no end goal it's a constantly evolving product company and uh, what we want to do tomorrow will be completely different from what we wanted to do 6 months ago so there is no end goal it will continue to evolve and uh, it will come continue to do you know new kind of thing any plans of uh, voluntarily moving out of the company at a certain uh, threshold well, maybe nothing that i can think of right now but no reason if there are better people doing what we are doing today that it shouldn't be considered absolutely absolutely just a, just a very uh, what do you call unconventional question from the entire course of the interview i just had this curiosity of asking you are you never moved by an existential crisis that uh, you're making money day in and day out like your company is doing really well but are you never moved by that existential crisis all the psychology and philosophy lays great emphasis on that at the end of the day it's all uh, what do you call you're all dust you're all a civilization yeah Yeah, sure. So I mean, there are. Well, I can take inspiration from some uh, great thinkers who might have thought about this a bit more than I have. Uh, when you think about anything, uh, be it you know, like it could be as uh, as noble as helping you know homeless kids. Think of absolutely anything. you think about anything long enough you can find a way uh to think about it to be meaningless uh, life in its truest form has no meaning or we don't understand what the meaning of life is so then you have to ask yourself do you want to spend your life trying to figure out the true meaning of things or would you rather focus this time on deceiving yourself into thinking things without meaning actually have meaning in being happy and uh, if i had to wager between the two i would pick the path of being happy every time <laughs> that that that's really convenient that's that's a really convenient perspective to look at that always choose to be happy and be surprised yeah and uh, nikhil on a, on a very general note what would your advice be to all the people who are on the verge of actually discovering their passion on the verge of actually exploring <laughs> yeah keep a keep a open mind don't get bogged down by peer pressure uh at the end of the day i mean life because of the pandemic 
as kind of thought is how uncertain everything is. Uh, so you don't need to be making more money than your classmates in two years, and you don't need to, you know, popular or cooler or anything that might hold priority in one's mind today. I think uh, take it easy, kind of don't fixate upon goals that have been uh, born out of mass psychology because everybody in your class might want a certain thing. It might not necessarily be, this, be the right thing for you. So take it easy in life, uh, figure out what you enjoy outside of work, career, uh, and all the expectations that might be upon you from your parents and your siblings and your relatives and all of that. At the end of the day, I think uh, what matters most is you do enjoy whatever path you take and you do have many facets to your life and it's not just education or college or your work life or whatever. They take it easy, relax, uh, think about many, many things and don't fixate on that one, you know, profession, money, college kind of thing. Being multidimensional helps adapt to the day. Yeah. That's a very... Yeah. yeah.